Five minutes.
Spencer, have you explained the process for how they can view um, the slideshow during this presentation? Yes, I will. Uh, not yet, but I will. Um, Excellent. If you, if you click on the big box or make sure that you're seeing uh, the main person speeding, or if you hold your mouse up and move it up and down, it'll pull up a white bar at the bottom of your screen that says board business meeting. Also at the bottom are three icons in the middle of a microphone, a telephone to leave the call, and a turn on or off your camera button. To the far right are three dots that say more options. If you click on the three dots over there on the right that say options, you can change your layout so that you can see. No, no you clicked the wrong one, Miss Later. <laughs> the wrong thing. Um, Yes. Okay, sorry. That's okay. You hit present now. But if you, you see that right there, what you're looking at right now, when you hit change layout and you go to sidebar, then you'll have the right view. So, um, okay. So you click those three buttons, change layout, and then you hit. There we go. Sidebar. Thank you. And with that, we are ready okay. to begin when you are. <laughs> yes. And just so that I can let everyone know that. Um, as we go through the meeting, each time that I ask for um, questions or comments, I am going to go through um, the board in the following order, Ms. Fisher, Ms. Landers, Ms. Griffith, Ms. Oaf, and um, ask each of you to um, unmute and say no comment or um, yes, and then what you want to say, just so that we can make sure that everyone has the opportunity to comment and um, that nobody, that we don't sit here waiting to see if somebody's going to comment. Does that make sense? Okay, see, I just did it. All right, with that, this meeting of uh, this, all right, this meeting of the Germantown Municipal School Board is now in session. And the first item of business is, this is where I gave up control of my computer. Okay. Is the approval of grant tenure to recommend the recommended teachers. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Manuel. Yeah, so hopefully everybody can see the screen on their left. Um, there is a standard process that's uh, prescribed by the state for granting tenure. And so at this time, uh, we're going to have the list showing of the teachers who are up for tenure, but I'll have Ms. Stratton explain to us the process uh, that teachers can reach tenure. Ms. Stratton. Thank you, Mr. Manuel. Um, just to give you a little background information on what tenure is, uh, simply put, tenure is an employment status, and all teachers in GMSD are considered either probationary or tenured. Tenure provides due process for teachers during discipline or dismissal cases, and in addition, tenured teachers have continuing employment with GMSD unless they're being dismissed for cause. And while Tennessee state law outlines the tenure eligibility requirements, the granting of tenure is a local board of education decision. And the GMSD teachers that we're recommending tonight for tenure consideration have served the required probationary status of working in a Tennessee public school for at least five years and have proven continued success as a classroom teacher by earning level of effectiveness scores of either above expectations or significantly above expectations within their last two years of teaching on a probationary status. These level of effectiveness scores are determined through classroom and professionalism evaluations, as well as student achievement and growth data. Uh, for your review, we do have a document that explained our process for identifying this year's tenure eligible teachers, as well as on the screen, you can see the individual names of the GMSD teachers who were recommending uh, the GMSD school board to grant tenure status. And at this time, Chairman Luter, I'm happy to answer any questions you or other members of the school board may have regarding the tenure process. Just for clarification, these teachers qualified for tenure based on their 2019 
no, their 2018-2019 service. Yes, you are correct. Um, we did not receive the level of effectiveness scores for the 18-19 school year until the fall of 2019. So we weren't able to determine their tenure eligibility until the fall. And so we always bring tenure recommendation um, to the school board in the spring of every year. So you're exactly right. These are people that earned um, tenure eligibility at the conclusion of the 18-19 school year. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Are there questions for Ms. Stratton? Ms. Fisher? No, all my questions have been answered. Thank you. Ms. Landers? No questions. Ms. Griffith? No questions. Ms. Oath? Yes, I just wanted to say, um, usually we celebrate these teachers after um, they are given granted tenure. Um, this is a really big deal for teachers. Um, and I know I've spoken to Mr. Manuel about it earlier, but we are planning to celebrate them after all of this is over, correct? Correct. Uh, what I feel like one of um, our tenure celebrations is one of the best things that we do in GMSD, and we absolutely will um, have an opportunity to recognize these 31 uh, exceptional uh, educators uh, in a formal tenure celebration. Thank you, that was my question. You, okay. We move to the second item on our agenda, approval of policy HR 5.3051 FSCRA leave. Um, and the recommendation is that we approve this policy after a first and final reading. And so I turn it to Mr. Manuel for explanation. So uh, as everyone is aware, we are in an unprecedented period of time uh, now. There is actually uh, state legislation and state school board policies that have been changed um, because we're in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, one of those changes that has come forward is the FFCRA leave. Uh, this is very similar to FMLA and actually defines it in light of uh, our current pandemic. So um, Ms. Stratton, I'll turn it over to you so you can explain the details for the board. Okay. Um, as Mr. Manuel had mentioned, this policy addresses the new provisions that are set forth by the federal government that apply to emergency paid sick leave and expanded FMLA leave, specifically related to COVID-19. Um, and these provisions apply to both full and part-time GMSD employees, which is a little different than our traditional FMLA leave um, policy that we have in place. In regards to the emergency paid sick leave, um, there, are, there are six reasons related to COVID-19 where an employee may be eligible to receive two weeks worth of paid leave if they're unable to work or telework. Um, the reasons center around being quarantined, experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, taking care of a family member who is quarantined or sick with COVID-19, or being unable to work because the employee has to care for a child whose daycare or school is closed due to COVID-19. In regard to the expanded FMLA leave portion of this policy, the FFCRA leave also expands FMLA leave to allow for employees who are unable to work or telework to take up to 12 weeks of leave to care for a child because of a school or daycare facility closure specifically related to COVID-19. Uh, this is a little different. This leaves a little different because the first 10 days of this leave are to be unpaid unless the employee chooses to take any existing leave that they might have available to them. And then after these initial two weeks, the remaining 10 weeks of expanded FMLA are to be taken at two thirds of the employee's daily rate of pay up to $200 per day. Um, or the employee can choose to utilize his or her own accrued sick leave to cover these days. So this is a very intricate policy um, that the federal government has um, uh, brought down. So the GMSD HR department is going to work with our employees on a case by case basis to complete a fact analysis to determine eligibility for leave and pay amounts. 
Um, and just another quick thing to note, it's important um, to remember about this FFCRA leave. It's set to expire December 31st of 2020, which is one of the main reasons why we want to have a standalone policy rather than just amending our current FMLA policy. Um, so at this time, Chairman Luter, I um, am, am more than happy to answer any questions that you or other board members uh, may have regarding GMSD policy 5.3051. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Uh, Ms. Fisher, do you have any questions? No, not at this time. Thank you. Ms. Landers? No, mine all have been answered. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Griffith? No, thank you. Ms. Oaf. None at this time, thanks. Thank you. You answered my question, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Estes? Should, yes, should um, director of schools be changed to superintendent? Yes. That is an edit change. Ms. Supermani, can we ask you to make that edit? It's in line four. We will make the, the yes, change prior to our that, meeting. I got that, Ms. Luter. Thank you. I don't see that it occurs again. Hearing no further discussion, we're gonna to move to item number three of our agenda, approval of external staffing of substitute workforce contract. Um, this is um, a contract that has been bid on and um, the recommendation is to grant the contract to Kelly Services, whom we have used in the past. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Manuel. So as you're aware, um since we have been formed as a district, we have outsourced our uh, substitutes. Um, we have a firm that actually provides the, those, that service for us. Uh, they help with recruiting. They do a number of things ar around getting these individuals in our district. Um, I will highlight that we are thankful at this time that this is one of those areas that we are outsourcing since we're not having to deal with uh, the workers, uh, comp or un unemployment, excuse me, uh, that other districts might be dealing with right now if these were in-house. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Stratton again to explain uh, our process we went through for this RFP and their selection of Kelly services. Um, like Mr. Manuel uh, just uh, mentioned, since 2014, GMSD has partnered with Kelly Services to provide substitute services in our school for our classroom teachers, um, our teachers going out on long-term leaves of absences, we call those interims, SPED assistants, ISS study hall monitors, and nurses. And our original contract with Kelly Services is set to expire on June 30th. So um, we thought it would be a great idea to go ahead and um, issue a request for proposal to, uh, for external staffing to see what was out there. We received two responses from companies, um, employer support services, or, or we all know them as ESS and Kelly Services. Um, an evaluation committee was assembled to review the RFPs and the committee reviewed um, and discussed components uh, which included recruitment, training, staffing, software, and pricing. And what you see on the screen right now is just a snapshot of the pricing between Kelly Services and ESS. One thing that I do just want to highlight for you um, is on this, uh, this handout right here, when a certified substitute is completing an interim assignment, his or her daily rate of pay does increase on the 21st day of teaching in that placement, which is why you see a distinction between a substitute teacher daily rate of pay and then the certified substitute teacher. Those are for our interims. Um, both companies were very similar or even identical when it came to the areas of recruitment, training, software, and pricing. But what stood out to our evaluation committee was the number of staff members specifically assigned to support the substitute in our schools. ESS is willing to dedicate one staff member for GMSD to handle recruitment, onboarding, training, and discipline. And Kelly Services has a total of three staff members supporting GMSD in these areas. 
Um, the committee is really excited about the addition of a Kelly Services position. It's called a substitute mentor. And they're allowing GMSD to recommend a retired GMSD teacher or administrator to serve in this role. The mentor is going to visit our substitutes in our schools on a weekly basis in the classrooms that they're working in to monitor and provide helpful advice on their performance. And we feel that by having a former GMSD employee as a substitute mentor, this person can assist the substitutes in maintaining the high level of expectations for teaching, as well as utilize additional instructional supports that GMSD has to offer. And just some other factors that the evaluation committee deemed favorable towards Kelly Services include that positive relationship that GMSD has already established with Kelly's as a vendor. Um, our substitutes would not have to reapply with a different company over the summer. And just looking towards the future, uh, Kelly Services could also fill some non-instructional positions such as like custodial, clerical, food service, school counselors, speech and language pathologists, and occupational therapists or physical therapists if we ever needed them to. So at this time, Chairman Luter, I'm happy to answer any questions that you or other members of the school board may have in regards to the recommendation to award the GMSC substitute vendor contract to Kelly Services. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Um, again, I'll go through each member. Ms. Fisher, do you have any questions? My only question was about the daily rate for a long-term sub and uh, Ms. Stratton answered that. And I'll just end with that. Um, I think the, I like the idea of the sub substitute mentor. I think that's be a nice addition. Thank you. Ms. Landers? No questions. Thank you, Ms. Griffith? Just want to thank Ms. Stratton uh, for breaking down the detail. The three staff members certainly as a benefit. And then since she brought up the committee, is that the group that's going to um, help us identify who this mentor will be? Uh, yes, so the committee has, we, ha we have talked about that um, and uh, we can seek the advice as well of um, um, some additional school level um, administrators as well as uh, our cabinet too. Okay, thank you. I can imagine that several of our folks might be interested. I was just curious what that process might yeah. entail. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you very much. And for my clarification, Ms. Stratton, that mentor will be an employee of Kelly Services. Correct. They'll be an employee of Kelly Services and they'll uh, be specifically assigned to GMSD. Thank you. And Ms. Ove, do you have any questions? No, mine have all been answered. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stratton, I do want to thank you for um, the work on this and for um, the work on getting the mentor position. I do think that that's really important. And hearing from our community, I think that we do want to support our substitutes, especially our long-term substitutes, in helping them to maintain the level of academics and um, excellence that we're used to in GMSD. So thank you. Yes, sure. Okay, we will move to the next item on our agenda, unless there is further discussion. The next item is number four, amended school activity fund audit contract 2019-20. Mr. Manuel. Um, yes, you're, as you're aware, uh, this is one of the required functions that we have to perform as a district is to make sure that we have an audit. Uh, so I'll let our CFO, uh, Mr. Jones, talk to us about this amendment to our current contract. Sure, uh, this amendment with Watkins Uberall uh, is to add Forest Hill Elementary School to uh, our contract for the 1920 audit. Uh, I believe there's an a increase in fee of about $3,500, uh, the total being $20,400. Thank you, um, Mr. Jones. Um, I'll open it up to questions, Ms. Fisher. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Landers. None at this time. Ms. Griffith. No questions at this time. Thank you. Ms. Ove. No questions. Thanks. Thank you. 
We will move to the next item on our agenda, which is item number five, Riverdale Painting Project. Um, Mr. Manuel. Yeah, so I think before we start talking about items five and six, uh, and we're talking about some capital improvements that we are going to um, ask the, the board to approve, we need to talk about our current status and our financial background for the district. So this slide should seem familiar. This is from, you can find this online. Uh, this is from our budget document for this past year. Uh, as you know, I, I tend to simplify things when we're talking to the public about percentages of where our revenue comes from. Uh, but there are several tax sources that comprise the ADA portion of our funding. So you can see there on the left, uh, of our county taxes, 40.74% of our current budget uh, comes from our county taxes in this current uh, fiscal year. That's 24 million, almost 25 million uh, dollars. Broken down specifically, if you look on the right, when we break down the, the taxes there, you can see the local option sales tax portion, uh, which is close to $6.8 million. Um, when we move forward and when we start making fiscal decisions and as we start talking about our budget, this is going to be a very important line item. Um, no one can predict how quickly our economy is getting ready to recover after this uh, period of time or at what point uh, all the uh, bans and, and groupings are, are going to be lifted, uh, we're kind of unsure at this time. But we do know in looking at revenue streams uh, for our city and our county, uh, that at this time, this sales tax has taken a dramatic uh, hit uh, to the tune of, I know some districts across the state are seeing 60%, other areas are seeing 40% reductions in the sales tax. And how quickly that is going to recover is something that I think our board needs to be aware of. Um, so moving forward, we, we could see a dramatic reduction in the sales tax portion. We can switch there. Uh, there's a, been another uh, change too. Uh, we have been very fortunate in the fact that the city of Germantown has paid since our inception uh, the settlement payment uh, to Shelby County Schools uh, for the buildings. And what we are paying for the OPEB contributions for the employees that were um, granted uh, to us, uh, we got five buildings out of this exchange, but every year GMSD and uh, the city on our behalf has made a payment to Shelby County Schools. We are in year six of this compromise and it, uh, it is a 12 year agreement and to the tune of $355, $453 a year, a uh, thousand. So this is a, um, a significant amount of money that we are now going to have to internalize into our budget because in light of the sales tax, um, challenges that the city is facing, they have asked us to take on uh, this payment. And it is um, per contract, our initial board uh, did agree to this. And so it is a requirement that we will have to, to pay moving forward. So in light of these two things, the fact that uh, we are gonna have to now make this uh, payment for, the, for six more years, and we could see some dramatic reductions um, in our sales tax revenues and the ADA portion, we are recommending moving slowly with some of these projects. So just so you can be aware of what we have already received, uh, the chart that you see on the screen, uh, to date we have received almost 2.8 million uh, for CIP projects from Shelby County Commission. We have to spend those on capital improvement projects. We're also uh, projected to receive another 623,000 uh, in County Commission funds uh, that have already been budgeted budgeted and we should see those for the end of the year. The city during last budget season also uh, said that they, and they are going to honor this, uh, going to provide for us $500,000 for secure entrance at Dogwood Elementary School. And then we still have 676,000 uh, left in our uh, general fund capital improvement budget. So it's almost 4.6 million. So what are we recommending that, that we do? We can go to the next slide. There are several projects that we bid out um, before this um, pandemic hit. Uh, one of those being Dogwood's ADA and secured entrance. Uh, that will include a ceiling tile and grid, LED lighting, a secure entrance. It also covers uh, door handles, ramps, uh, everything to make sure that that uh, school is our first to, to really be upgraded. And uh, the bid came in at 3.7 million. We also have a painting project, uh, the Riverdale Painting Project. Now painting cannot be considered 
a capital improvement project for the Shelby County Commission purposes, uh, they, they will not consider painting uh, as a capital improvement project. But we do have money in our general fund, as we saw in the, the last chart, uh, to pay for this. So there's $328,323 uh, is the lowest bid that came back for uh, the best bid that came back for the Riverdale painting project um, for a total of uh, $4 million. So there were other things that we also bid out that uh, I think that we need to move a little bit slower uh, in going forward. Now, the first we don't have uh, control over. Uh, the Houston Middle School Edition, uh, in, in light of everything that has happened financially, the city of Germantown uh, is postponing going to bond uh, for the Houston Middle School Edition. So that's $5 million that we would not have for this project, and we don't have the, the money to, to pay for it outright ourselves. So previously, this board had moved $3 million uh, from our reserve into our general fund to, to pay for this project. Our recommendation, uh, at the end of the year, everything rolls back into the reserve. This money will go back into our reserves and save it for whenever the city is able to go to bond for this. Or that as a school board, we can look at our revenue streams uh, in the near future and look at how we can pay for this project internally. But it would be a real struggle without that $5 million uh, from the city. We'd also bid out bathroom renovations at uh, several of our schools to finish those projects. And you can see the amounts that came back with the, the best bid for each of those uh, schools at Farmington, Riverdale, um, Houston High School, and Houston Middle School. So our recommendation is to temporarily postpone the bathroom renovation projects until we see what is going to happen uh, financially as a district. Uh, as a cabinet, we have been making very serious um, efforts to prepare for. Um, a difficult situation financially. So all of our cabinet members have, have been asked to cut 10% from their budgets. Uh, we know that this is a challenge specifically in some departments that really just have a lot in, in, in people, not as much in programs. So we wanna make sure that we are prepared for this, but I am thankful for how our previous board and how our cabinet has moved us uh, carefully through this time. Uh, we have built up a reserve. Now we've talked about our reserve in the past and, and the fact that we have to have uh, millions, uh, close to $8 million, just to pay the bills until our funding comes in every single year. Uh, but beyond that, we built a reserve just for times like this, so that we can continue our programs, we can continue our staffing without having impacts on children and what's happening in the schools. Um, but because of the uncertain times, our recommendation, like I said, is to postpone the bathroom renovation, and we don't have a choice for the Houston Mill School Edition, but save that money for the Houston Mill School Edition until the city uh, comes back to us and is ready to go to bond for us. Other things that, um, Ms. Crowder, you can switch to the next slide, please. Other things that I, I think we need to discuss and Mr. Jones can hop in. Um, I had a question about what our reserve was going to be. So Mr. Jones, uh, if you wanna give an estimate of where you think we are at this time. I think where we are at this time, uh, we began the year with a $19 million uh, reserve. Uh, right now, of course, it depends upon the uh, sales tax revenues for the remainder of the year, which will actually be through August. Uh, we're looking at approximately $22 million in reserves. So as I stated our, our recommendation for these projects is to go ahead and do the, the two projects. The one that we've already received funding for from um, the Shelby County Commission for Dogwoods ADA project and the Riverdale painting project. Um, so Mr. Kathy um, will go through the, the individual bids and, and the process for selecting these bids. Mr. Kathy. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, so first we're gonna go over the Riverdale painting uh, project bid. And so for this bid, um, we uh, broke this out into three separate pieces for the bid. Um, you see the base bid in front of you, that is to paint uh, building B, which is the main building, and building C, um, and building C is uh, the kindergarten building. So when we look at this, we knew that those were the two that were in the most dire need of being painted. We also put in some ad alternates and ad alternate number one um, is pricing in addition to the base bid to electrostatically paint all the exterior metal and plastic surfaces, which is mainly metal at Riverdale. 
Um, it is important to note that an ad alternate provides an amount above and beyond the base bid to perform the work. However, it is not an alternate or independent price to complete the work separate from the base bid. Um, there are amounts included in the base bid to complete the work without using the electrostatic painting process. So it's important to note that the amount included in ad alternate number one is the price in addition to the base bid for which the contractor will complete the electrostatic painting process. Um, I won't go into the, all of the chemistry of what electrostatic painting is, but I'll give a little background. It's a process uh, that's achieved by positively charging the atomized paint particles as they are applied so uh, that the paint attracts uh, to the negatively charged piece or surface being painted. In short, you've got positive uh, going on to negative and opposites attract. Uh, the advantages of that process include increased uh, increase or improve quality, better bonding, uh, better aesthetics, and more longevity at the end of the job. So the, the paint job lasts longer, um, has a better finish. So this is something given the pricing that we got that we are recommending in this case. Um, add alternate number two is the price to paint the A building, which is the newer middle school edition. What we found there, this is really our first building where we've done drywall and sheetrock in lieu of uh, CMU block and it, it looks tremendous. However, we are finding that the paint job does not hold up nearly as well or as long. It shows a lot more when there are nicks and, and bumps on the walls. Um, that building, especially in the classrooms, is starting, you, you're start, you start to see uh, where it's getting worse for the wear. But however, Mr. Manuel went through the budget uh, concerns that we have, and due to all of those aforementioned budgetary concerns, we are not recommending uh, at, at alternate number two, which would be painting of the newer building or the A building at this time. Uh, we did have three respondents to this bid. Uh, professional painting services did withdraw their bid. Uh, Sproul Construction uh, did not bid at alternate number one, which is something that we are going to recommend. And that's the main reason we are recommending to award the bid um, for base bid and at alternate number one to Savage Brothers. Um, as Mr. Manuel mentioned, this project would be funded with the GMSD general fund as it does not meet Shelby County's definition of a capital improvement project. And that's all I have in this looter. I'm going to turn it back over to you and I will be available if the board has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. Um, I'll go through the board for questions. Ms. Fisher. Um, I really don't have any questions. They've been answered. My main concern was that at this time, would we have funds and should we spend them? So I appreciate the detailed um, explanation on where we stand. I know that since the beginning, the district has been very conservative in its spending. And I appreciated hearing that um, we do have money set aside in our reserves to start the new year, as well as extra reserves in this time of um, a loss of sales tax. So thank you for the, the um, explanation. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Ms. Landers? Um, I too would echo, uh, thank you, Mr. Manuel and um, Mr. Jones for filling us in, uh, particularly for the projection of the reserves toward the end of the year. But um, in these tenuous times, it, it helps to really be on top of where we are financially. Um, my only question would be to Mr. Kathy is, um, we have used Savage Brothers before, yes. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. We, they painted uh, Houston High School and they also painted Dogwood. So they, they have uh, painted two of our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. Ms. Griffith? I would also like to uh, reiterate uh, appreciation for Mr. Jones, um, helping everyone understand uh, the current and potential future position as it pertains to our financial status uh, of our general um, fund or the reserve in particular. And Ms. Landers just asked the question I was gonna ask. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Griffith. Ms. Oaf? Yes, I echo what all three of my fellow board members have already said. Thank you, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kathy, and Mr. Manuel for that information. I do have a question um, regarding all construction and capital projects for the district. Um, what is the impact of um, the stay-at-home orders on the progress that we're making on current projects and then these projects that we're approving now? 
Sure. So the um, the stay at home order, if unless I'm mistaken, is scheduled to end April 30th in Tennessee, at least tentatively. Um, but construction has been deemed an essential uh, business. And so all of our projects that were already in motion, like the Houston High Athletic Fieldhouse, the band addition, uh, those projects have continued. And uh, we've spoken with our uh, contractors and, and uh, if the board awards these, uh, their plan would be to start and staff these projects. They are continuing to, to work and practice social distancing as best you can on a construction project. Will these One last question, Mr. Kathy, um, with that last comment that you said, would the painting go, since school is closed, would painting go ahead and start sooner or we are going to have to move furniture, the teachers are going to have to pack up? What What is the, the process? Yes, ma'am. We're working, we're working with our principals on the logistics for that. Uh, now that we have gotten the announcement uh, late last week, early this week, that uh, school is closed for the remainder of the year. We do want to go ahead and start these projects early, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at Dogwood especially, but Riverdale as well. But we do need to give opportunity for, our, you know, our teachers were kind of forced out uh, at the end of spring break without any real knowledge that they wouldn't have an opportunity to come back. Uh, the same with our students, uh, parents, and everyone. So we do want to give another opportunity for everyone to come for teachers to come and get what they would like to get out of their classrooms, uh, to do what they need to do in their classrooms, to prepare them. And we'll practice the same, uh, same, same things that we've done in the past where we're trying to uh, bring them up there no more than 10 at a time, have signups. And then once those final opportunities have been given, go ahead and start with those capital projects. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. I have no more questions. Are there any further questions? I wanna reiterate everyone's appreciation for the financial picture and for um, the, the ability to move forward with this project. Um, being in Riverdale uh, in the old building for uh, Dr. Seuss reading day, I got to see how much that building needs to be painted. Um, and this is, in my opinion, not an optional project. So thank you very much. We will move to the next item, um, which is the Dogwood Elementary ADA project. Um, Mr. Manuel, Mr. Kathy. Mr. Manuel, would you like me to go ahead? Proceed, Mr. Kathy. Yes, sir. Um, for the Dogwood ADA bid, uh, this bid was also broken out into several sec uh, sections. The base bid includes, and Mr. Manuel mentioned some of the things, but it is all, uh, all encompassing the interior and the exterior of the building for ADA. Some of the breakdown you see in the bid where the, where the pricing was kind of itemized and broken out, but even that's not all inclusive. Uh, um, we're talking everything from door handles to slopes. Uh, to everything in between, uh, bathrooms. Uh, Ms. Huffman had requested an additional one as well, and we were able to add that to make it comparable for our other schools. And so there is a wealth of work in that ADA bid package. Uh, alternate number one includes a nurse, new secure entrance along with uh, some very modest but very well needed office space and conference rooms to go on that addition. As Mr. Manuel mentioned earlier, that bid came in and most of that will be covered with City of Germantown dollars. And then alternate number two includes all above ceiling work. So that's an all new sprinkler system there as that school does not have a, a sprinkler system. Uh, new ceiling tile and grid system, new LED lighting system and all other associated above ceiling work. Mr. Pierce is also going to get to recable uh, there. So as we're bringing dogwood up to the standards above ceiling that we've brought our other elementary schools up to. He's also going to be able to recable there and bring it up to the same technology standards that our other elementary schools have been brought up to. So we will have a standard in place where we have LED lights, ceiling tile and grid, and all of those things at, at all of our elementary schools. So we're, we're getting there one year at a time. Um, we are not recommending al alternates number three and four. Those were for a new handrail system and the pricing did not come in favorable. Uh, so that's not something that we're going to recommend that we move forward with at this time. Um, grinder Taper Grinder was the low bidder for this, and that's who we're going to recommend uh, to approve for the base bid along with alternates number one and number two. 
As Mr. Mannion mentioned, our goal is to fund this project using a combination of Shelby County Commission and City of Germantown uh, funding that must be used for capital improvement projects. And that's all I have. I'll send it back over to Ms. Luter and we'll be available if the board has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Cathy. Uh, Ms. Fisher, do you have any questions? No, I do not have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Landers. No questions, thank you. Ms. Griffith. Thank you so much, Mr. Cathy. Um, I just, and this may be something I need to ask Mr. Jones uh, in a previous slide when the um, amounts were shown, the 3.7 million, that includes the 500,000 from the city. I just wanted to confirm that was combined into that. Uh, yes, the uh, the funding for uh, the Dogwood Elementary School project, we already have the cash on hand in our CIP or Capital Projects Fund. And then I believe, Josh, if I'm correct, the additional $500,000 would come from the city. That's correct. So, Ms. Griffith, I think the slide you're referring to had $2.8 that we'd already received cash in hand. Uh, there was an additional $623,000 that we are scheduled to receive in this fiscal year, which would get your number up to a little over $3.4 million. And then the additional $500,000 coming from the city would get us up to $3.9 million. Okay, thank you. Yeah, what I wrote that figure down and I was just made a note to, to ask if it was included in that or if it would be in addition to that amount. And so I was just, that's just clarification purposes. I understood where it was coming from and I, maybe not the timing, but just I was curious about that 3.7 that was listed for all that. So if the two point, I think what you just mentioned um, does or doesn't include, I just want to make sure the breakdown of that slide that I'm understanding, because like I said, I took the notes and I took the picture and just making sure that um, I know if it includes those, that $500,000 or not. Yes, yes ma'am. Can, can we move back to the, the previous slide when we talk about the financial background? That's the uh, actual cost is 3.7. This one right here, I think you're referring to Ms. Griffith. No, it was um, the one that was just up. Was with, okay, it was the other one on the expenditures. Yes. Yeah, so this this one summarized the total cost for the Dogwood ADA and secure interest of 3.7. Um, yeah, how we fund that is made up of those other sources too. So um, you can see the other sources that we've received and that we have on hand. That answers it perfectly. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Ms. Ove, do you have any questions? No, Ms. Griffith asked my questions for me. So thank you, Ms. Griffith. Thank you all. Are we ready to move to the next item on the agenda? Item number seven is GMSC fiscal year 2019-20 miscellaneous budget amendments numbers 18, 19, and 20. Um, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Manuel and Mr. Jones. Yeah, so th the first one that uh, we'll look at is number 18. Um, number 18 or budget amendment number 18 is actually pays and, and appropriates the funding. So if we can go forward a slide and show the actual budget amendment, there we go. Um, it actually moves the money into the right categories for that Dogwood 88 project if the board approves that project. That would be budget amendment number 18. Are there any questions on 18 before we move to the other budget amendments? Ms. Fisher? No questions, thank you. Ms. Landers? None, thank you. Ms. Griffith? None for me at this time, thank you so much. Ms. O? None, thank you. Mr. Manuel? Budget amendment number 19. I'll let Mr. Bland explain number 19. So this budget amendment is to cover uh, predicted costs incurred with students that we have in healthcare facilities. Uh, we presently have five students in facilities and three have been there long term. So we need to move additional funds to cover those costs. Any questions? Ms. Fisher? None at this time, thank you. Ms. Landers? None, thank you. Ms. Griffith? None, thank you. Ms. Oates? None, thank you. 
Okay, and budget amendment number 20. I'll let Mr. Jones handle number 20. Uh, yes, we're asking the board to approve an additional appropriation in the OPEP trust fund of $220,000 for retiree medical claims. Uh, for the quarter ending March 31, 2020, uh, this is the amount of actual claims incurred, but we need the additional appropriation to pay or actually transfer $220,000 from our OPEP trust to our health insurance fund uh, where the claims were actually paid. Any questions? Ms. Fisher? None at this time, just thankful that we have a OPEP trust to pay these costs. Yes, Ms. Landers? Ditto and no questions, thank you. Ms. Griffith? Third time's a charm, thank you, Mr. Jones. And Ms. Oath? Thank you, Mr. Jones, no questions. Thank you. The final item on our agenda is um, item number eight, resolution for waiver of policies in COVID-19, a heavy one. Mr. Manuel. Yes, I, I think uh, this is for clarity for our community and also for the board. Um, as far as our role as a public school uh, in the state of Tennessee, I, I think it's helpful to understand some of the background of, of what we've experienced and why we need to waive these policies. So the, the first uh, component is we are a, a public uh, school in Tennessee. And as such, uh, we are beholden to follow the Tennessee school board policy. So um, recently the state school board did pass policy 0520102. Uh, and what that stated was that students shall not be given an unexcused absence or reported as truant as a result of any absences during the period of school closure. So why is this important for us to talk about students not being given an unexcused absence or counted truant? Um, so I'll quote uh, Dr. Morrison, who is the executive director of the Tennessee State School Board. Uh, she, in, in her words, we felt this was a necessary clarification because many of our students statewide do not have access to reliable internet service. They may also be taking on additional roles and responsibilities in their families, such as watching younger siblings and things like that during this time when many more students are at home. So we do not want to penalize students with unexcused absences when they are unable to participate in online or instructional options. So in several uh, interactions with uh, Tennessee School Board Association, uh, where they do have legal counsel, and that is a picture of Chuck Cagle, uh, there were several questions posed as far as what does that mean in reference to uh, fourth quarter grades? Can we take fourth quarter grades? Can we move on with new instruction? And the recommendation is that we not take fourth quarter grades uh, because the state school board stance is that if a student is not present, uh, that we cannot hold them accountable. So you could have a situation where students are not attending any of the events. They are not doing any of the activities. How do you provide them a grade? Uh, in contrast with students who are being provided uh, those activities or opportunities. But it, it's a broader question, it's a deeper question. It's really a question of equity. And so this is a picture that a lot of educators have, have seen and I think it, it really helps you understand the difference between equality and equity. Um, all of our students don't come in the same. Uh, they don't have the same foundational levels. They don't have the same levels of ability. Um, they don't have the same support at home uh, and I know a lot of us think that uh, Germantown is, is truly a homogeneous environment. It is not. Our students have a wide range of uh, blessings and also challenges that they face every single day. So you see the, the picture on the right uh, uh, or left, excuse me, of equality uh, where students are, who are given the same supports may not be as successful. And I know it's as simple as looking over a fence, but some students need more support. They need more help. And so in, when you provide equity, and especially with our students with disabilities or our students who are coming from uh, single family households or the economically disadvantaged, they may have different struggles than other students. And so uh, in education, we have to provide additional supports for them. What would happen, and you see the picture of reality on the right, if we continued fourth quarter instruction, if we moved on with new standards and, and new learning opportunities, we would be leaving a large uh, number of our students behind even more so than we have in the past, because it won't just be those students uh, who are, are coming in with skill deficits. It may be students who previously 
uh, have that support and have that benefit, but because of the illness in their family or the financial situation that they're facing or they're taking care of younger siblings, they may not be able uh, to invest in the same type of education remotely that our other students can. So a question of equity was very important for the state school board, and they wanted to be sure that all students across the state uh, were treated e equally or equitably um, so that uh, we don't leave some students behind. So um, we have dealt with this in the past, and I think it's something that Germantown prides ourselves on. Um, in Tennessee public schools, and especially in Germantown schools, all means all. That means that we are providing benefits for all of our students. And if you look, and I know we use ACT averages a lot, but I think it's more important to talk about those students, um, all of our students who are scoring a 21 or higher on the ACT. And, and that means that they are um, ready to move on to college readiness. Well, we are not just focusing on our highest scores. We're not focusing on our average. We're focusing on those numbers of students and how can we provide supports? How can we teach them? How can we really grow those students? And you've seen what we've done uh, just in the past you know, six years since we've been a district of moving from 74.4% of our students over a 21 on the ACT to 86.2. That's a lot of hard work from a lot of our staff. And we wanna be careful that we don't regress, that we don't leave those uh, students behind, whether it's the federal subgroup designations of economically disadvantaged students with disabilities, Black, Hispanic, Native American, or English language learners, or now we've got a, a new group of students who may be uh, in relation to the COVID crisis who have difficulty and challenges in engaging with a virtual or online curriculum. So we can move on if we'll go to the next slide. So what can we do? And what has the state school board recommended that we do? What they've said was that our students did not have the opportunity to really pull themselves up uh, in the fourth quarter. And, and across the state, a lot of students really use that last uh, nine weeks to really buckle down and bring up their averages. So the state school board did change their grading policy. And, and it says that students in the spring semester shall not receive any grade lower than they earned in the course as of March 20th. So for us, that was right before uh, spring break. What did they earn for the third nine weeks? but that we did have the opportunity to go back and reteach standards, reteach material, provide extra learning opportunities for those students to raise their third quarter grades. So that when we are looking at a semester average, they are going to be able to, to not just be held accountable if they had a bad third nine weeks and have a long-term impact because of this crisis. We wanna provide them the opportunity to improve that third nine weeks grade. So if we we'll let Ms. Price talk about what is that going to look like in Germantown schools? So based on um, the rules from the State Board of Education and based on the recommendation by Commissioner Schwinn, um, which was a school closure toolkit updated on 414, she makes note in there that considerations for learning activities that are based upon content and skills already experienced by students may be the most appropriate at this time, given the anxieties many students and adults are facing. So what um, the teaching and learning team, as well as the high school, got together and looked at the number of standards that, I'm um, sorry, the number of grades that are required for the grade book are 10. So we looked at letting students have the opportunity to make up five of those assignments. And in high school, assignments are weighted. So we'll have two in-depth or heavier weighted assignments that they can make up and replace their two lowest grades. And then they'll also have the opportunity to make up three supporting assignments. Again, replacing three of their uh, lowest grades in those supporting assignments. We asked them to make sure that they were covering essential quarter three standards and that um, be mindful that students may be wanting to recover grades in more than one course. So just being mindful of how much time they're asking students to spend. We are availing this to all high school credit bearing courses um, with, if you refer to the SBAE rules, um, they went through for 11th and 12th grade. We feel like all high school credit bearing students are in the same boat. They're not having that opportunity to bring up any grades in the fourth quarter. Um, and that will be on their transcript. So the team felt this was the best, uh, in the best interest of all the students. 
So students or our teachers have already created assignments and we are saying you may use those assignments you've already created. You may create new assignments. You may take assignments you had from third quarter and change them up. That is completely up to the teachers. Um, and that all IEP and 504 accommodations that are in place, they must be applied to all activities that are allowed. So again, we have those two uh, in-depth assignments and they'll replace those two lowest grades. And then the three other assignments will be different, the, a lower tier of work, such as classwork, homework, quizzes, et cetera. Um, the replacements must benefit the student's overall score. The student cannot have, as Mr. Manuel um, mentioned before, a grade lower than they had on March 20th. Um, and they don't have to complete all assignments. If, they, if the students look at their scores and determine they only need to make one major assignment a better grade to bring their grade up, then they, they may do that. Teachers are expected to help and guide students on what maybe some of those good choices would be. And Mr. Manuel and I spoke with teachers, the entire staff um, on Friday at, with the high school. And then we've continued conversations today through my team. And my team has also come up with an FAQ for the teachers to answer a lot of the questions they had over the weekend. So I think everybody's in a, in a go motion. And so that leads us to what's next. So here's the plan. April 20th today, the teachers began meeting with PLCs and choosing and crafting what opportunities they're going to make available to students. Tomorrow, a survey will be delivered via all of our modes of media through the high school. Um, Mr. Gillespie, Mr. Constant, uh, Ms. Abel, and Mr. Taylor worked on a survey today with some teacher support. And they will put that out on all media, all of our media outlets to make sure we get to as many students as possible, just to make sure everybody knows they have that opportunity. If students don't answer in some way, shape, or form, we'll be following up via guidance counselor or students. On May 4th, all teachers must have all five opportunities available to students. They can start putting those opportunities out as soon as they wish, but by May 4th, they all have to be available. And then students will have until the 15th of May to complete any assignments they want for improvement of their grade and to their teachers so that their teachers have time to grade them and make those adjustments to the third quarter grades. So what's next? Our future steps. So we know there's still a lot of things that we need to continue doing. This is uh, just one more thing that's um, in that is great for our students that are in credit bearing courses. And I didn't mention before that does include our eighth grade students that are taking high school courses. Um, we will continue to have learning opportunities provided all the way up until the last day of school um, and have those have our teachers offering two to three learning opportunities weekly. Um, we will continue using our family friendly choice boards that offer more than just online or screen time activities and cover everything uh, everything that we do at school, PE, art, music, um, all the different categories. We will continue our televised lessons that Ms. Crowder and Mr. Manuel and Mr. Sweeney have done an amazing job um, getting that um, going. And we will also continue our live session Google Hangouts. Next, what are we gonna do about those untaught standards? So it took the teachers and the team a long time to really go through and analyze and make sure um, what standards had been thoroughly taught and what standards we still had to go. And so after analyzing those standards, um, we're gonna develop a detailed plan for students to receive that necessary instruction and make sure that they're ready and they're gonna be successful with next year's standards. Um, this plan that we come up with will ensure equity and the ability for to close the gaps for all students and not leave anybody behind. So here's what it looks like. Elementary standards, we were left with about 11% left. And so I just want to give you an example. In, um, in ELA, um, kindergarten had three standards left, one writing and two in foundational literacy. Um, some other things across the board were writing and then a few 
for reading literature and reading informational text. But with ELA, we teach those standards, they're year long. Um, so we're adding on to them, just making them a little bit, um, a little bit harder each time and maybe just changing up the material that they're reading. With math, um, kindergarten was only, only missing two standards. The first grade did not get to geometry, um, which is not an essential standard for second grade. Um, and some of the other ones were measurement and data. And um, again, geometry like in, in the fifth grade. So when we look at the major work of the grade, we have covered the majority of it. And then um, the same goes for middle school. Middle school, it looks like we have a bigger chunk of standards, but they had also more total standards. So um, it was geometry in seventh grade. Uh, no, I'm sorry, geometry across seventh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then we had statistics and probability for that piece. And then ELA, it was writing and uh, those found, um, writing and, sorry, um, speaking and listening skills. And in the high school, there's 200 courses. So I don't have exactly where that breakdown might be, but um, overall, I feel very confident that we'll be able to come up with a solid plan for our students and we won't skip a beat going into next year. Matt, so uh, I will, yeah, I will really hit the future steps. And I, and I do want to clarify, why are we just focusing on the, the students who are in high school credit bearing courses? It's because those are the courses and grades that move on with students. We don't truly have transcripts for elementary school students or students in sixth and seventh grade unless they're they're taking high school courses so the focus for those students would be more around the mastery and the, the untaught standard so I, I know that there are some people saying well what grade opportunities will we have for those students in third grade well we a, a grade isn't as crucial for them because we're not making decisions about how they're going to matriculate or it's not going to impact how they're going to get into a college or university uh, so for those students it's more around what uh, standards they haven't learned and how can we prepare them for the next grade level. Uh, the grade isn't as crucial for those students. But our future steps for closing out the year. Uh, uh, I know that some schools have already started, but we have asked our high schools to develop uh, plans for the personal uh, property pickup of the parents and also the staff. And so they'll be releasing calendars uh, and for people to sign up to get the materials and things that they need from the schools. That also allows um, people to come up to the school to drop off school issued materials. Uh, so we know like from our seniors, for example, we will need to collect their laptops from those students, uh, from our seniors. Uh, also, I know that there are students in band, for example, and we need to have a plan to, to collect their band uniforms. But there are lots of things that students have to turn back in at the end of the school year that we'll need to collect, whether it's library books or other materials. And we'll be rolling out those plans in the next week to two weeks, uh, depending on what school uh, students attend. And then we'll be preparing our facilities for the summer safely, making sure that we don't have too many people and we're not violating uh, the orders uh, from our local municipality or from the, the state level. And then last but not least, I think it's important to know that we are looking at all the different options to honor our students, whether they're moving up from their elementary schools to middle school, moving from middle to high, or also our seniors who are getting ready to graduate. We are working on lots of different avenues and plans uh, around how can we honor them, and, and it's not just going to be a one-size-fits-all, but a lot of it is dependent upon uh, what is going to happen in the next uh, few weeks in our local community and, and broader community, and are we going to be able to meet in groups, but know that we're working on all the plans, uh, possibilities uh, to honor all of our students. Um, so with that, um, I would like to turn it back over to you, Ms. Luter, and to the board uh, if we have other questions, because there are specific policies that we do have to um, waive from this. Uh, no, it's 4.640, the grading policy, 4.605, grading requirements, 4.700, testing, 5.109, uh, personnel evaluations, 5.61 on educator licenses, and then 6.200, attendance and truancy. All of those need to be waived because they are in contradiction with the, the state, uh, but no, hopefully you understand the, the rationale uh, behind. Uh, why the state chose uh, to make this, these policy changes and how we are going to implement them. Thank you, Mr. Manuel and Ms. Price. Sorry, Mr. Manuel? No, that's okay, go ahead. Um, 
I will go ahead and go down through the um, members of the board for questions. Ms. Fisher. First, I want to thank Ms. Price. I think all of us would agree. She presented a great deal of material to us on how things are going to proceed. And she answered a lot of questions that I think all of us as board members um, have been, um, been hearing. So thank you. I do have one question though. When you talked about um, reaching out to the students about opting out um, for um, improving their grades, are the parents going to get that email as well? Because I can see a student saying, well, I don't want to do it and opting out and their parents not knowing they opted out. That um, survey will go out through Skyalert as well as on the website. The teachers will be sending it out through email. So as long as we have parents information in one of those media outlets, the parents will see that information. Thank you. And I, I also want to echo that um, we will also be reaching out to people who don't opt out um, because there may be people who don't have um, internet or they don't have uh, te technological access. And so we want to make sure that somebody just didn't miss the message too. So the teachers and school level administration will be reaching out to people that they don't hear from, from to make sure that no one misses this opportunity for Q3 uh, grade improvements. Um, I just have one more question. And um, um, when the teachers are putting the assignments together, have they been given some guidance about equity so that maybe one teacher doesn't give a 20 page paper and another one a two page paper? I just have you had some discussion about equity of assignments? We did. We asked them to work in their PLC groups and possibly come up with an assignment all Algebra 1 students will get, so it's across the board. Um, there, are some, there are some courses that are only, um, they only have one teacher that teaches them, so we've met with them, but we really um, tried to drive home that students are going to possibly be making up more than, or improving grades in more than one course. And so to be very mindful of that, and really the recommendation is about an hour a day per, um, per course. But since we broke it down to assignments, I didn't really wanna say you know, no more than four hours a week, but that's kind of what we gave them the parameters of um, through the PLCs, through um, the assistant principal and print, or I'm sorry, through Missy, Mr. Taylor and Ms. Abel and um, talk to them about that on Friday. Thank you. I don't have any more questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Ms. Landers? Um, I too will add my thanks to the superintendent and to Ms. Price for the comprehensive explanation of the necessity and the reasoning behind the resolution. Um, and for me, most importantly, laying out so clearly the path forward. Um, with that, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffith. I don't think there is any doubt that um, the presentation has addressed and answered so many of the uh, questions that I'm sure both uh, Ms. Price and Mr. Manuel have been receiving directly as have our board and all the administrations and teachers that are in our district. Thank you, thank you, thank you for not only uh, making it simple to understand, but also um, providing the detail that um, helps un the community better understand the why behind the what we're doing. Um, I personally wanna thank the district for um, allowing the ninth and 10th grade students um, to be kind of part of this in a, in a way that I think not all districts are focusing on. I think a lot of people are really, really gearing um, a lot of these opportunities towards 11th and 12th grade. And so I know we live in a community where everybody takes everything very seriously as it pertains to high school transcripts. So I'm really glad to see that it's for all students with credit bearing um, or yeah, uh, courses. So thank you again for the wonderful explanation and for um, making sure that we cover all the bases. Thank you, Ms. Griffith. Ms. O. Well, fourth time's a charm. I also want to express my thanks um, to Ms. Price and to Mr. Manuel for this thorough explanation. Um, I do have a question, um, probably more for Mr. Manuel. Um, as you uh, communicate regularly with other superintendents, is this consistent with what you're seeing across the state um, in terms of um, the expectations of teachers and students? Yes, and I, I think this is one thing that makes uh, our Shelby County superintendent so special. We have all been uh, working together 
And I know Ms. Price's team and, and the other uh, academic departments and exceptional student departments uh, in all the municipalities, I know Ms. Huffman has, has done a lot of work with her uh, peers and partners too, but we're all working together to make sure that we're offering comparable services too that are in line with state policies. And as the board's aware, you know, I uh, serve as the, the chair of the Southwest Corps, uh, and that's superintendents from around this region, and we are all uh, doing the uh, similar process. It may be different in just the number of assignments that they get to make up in that Q3, but it is very similar. So uh, I will, will echo that we are all uh, pulling in the same direction because we are all public schools in Tennessee. Thank you. Um, I also want to express my thanks to all the teachers that have worked hard um, up to this point. It's been amazing to me to see with my kids um, and I, I hear from other parents how excellently our teachers have stepped up to do these things um, online in ways they've never done before. Um, and the care that they have shown to our children um, and our students, uh, that the concern is not just academic, but for our whole, whole child. And I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Ev. I had just one question for clarification. Um, our survey that we're sending out via all media outlets is for you understand that you have this opportunity, correct? We're making sure that everybody knows, or are we asking everybody, do you want to take the opportunity, yes or no? Both. Um, so it, it'll be both. So we're reaching out to everybody. They ha And the reason we, we discussed this and debated it about whether it's opt-in or opt-out, it is both for us. So we're not only wanting to know are you wanting to take advantage of this and in what class? Uh, and also, are there any accommodations or modifications that, that you need? Uh, we're gathering all that information, but we also wanna see the students that say, no, I'm not interested in raising my grade at this time, because if somebody is not an opt-in or an opt-out, uh, like I said, we're gonna be reaching out to them and communicating with them to make sure that they don't miss those opportunities. So no one is lost or left behind. So we really also need to push out to families, make sure you make a family decision on this. Yes, ma'am. Because you do have the potential for mom to say, yes, they are, and the student to say, no, I'm not. Got it. <laughs> so family decisions will be important on this one. Yes, ma'am. Anything else in further business? Ms. Fisher, do you have further business? No, ma'am. Ms. Landers? No, ma'am. Ms. Griffith? No, I do not. Ms. Oaf? No, I do not. Mr. Manuel? No, ma'am. Then we stand adjourned. We will begin our six o'clock meeting um, at 6.18. I'll give Ms. Subramani, an extra minute. Will that work? Actually, the that meeting is scheduled for 6.30. <laughs> but is it scheduled yeah. for 6.30? Yes, so we can, yes. we can reconvene at 6.30. Yay, I, I don't know why I thought it was scheduled at 6 o'clock. Yay, very good. And we can turn until 6.30. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.